NFT is going to survive the bear market? That's the question we're trying to answer today. We're gonna to look at tons of trends, statistics, different projects and case studies of those projects. Let's get analytical, boys. Let's roll up the sleeves. I guess I don't even have sleeves to roll up, but let's roll them up. If you do have sleeves, you can roll up and let's try to find the best trends to follow for an NFT bear market. Also, if you comment on this video, you can win five whitelist spots for Jukiverse. So make sure to comment and like, also subscribe, but let's get into that interview today with NFT statistics. Yo, it's cool times with Punk9059, aka NFT statistics on Twitter. And we wanted to talk about NFT statistics today. Look, I know we're in a down market right now, but we can still sink our teeth into some analytics. And who else better to do this than NFT statistics? By the way, how did you get how did you get started doing stats for NFTs on your Twitter account? Which we have opened up right here. Yeah, so I wanted to buy a punk uh, last summer. And you know, I, I buy stocks, and the first thing I wanted to do was see how prices of punks had behaved in the past. And I couldn't find a single floor price chart anywhere. Like throughout the internet, every, all the analytics I could find online about, about NFTs, I saw nothing that showed historic floor prices. So I basically just started building it. Uh, every day I'd go to the punk site and I'd check the floor price and I kept a Google doc and just record it. And over time that became a pretty big kind of data history. And then I expanded into apes and did punks and apes. And then I just realized there was demand to know kind of like this whole market as a whole. And you know, th that was kind of the evolution here was uh, really just realizing that this really important data it didn't exist out there. So there's actually a little bit of a schism between like my world and your world where I actually don't rely on data and analytics too much, but obviously 25,000 people that follow you on Twitter do. Uh, one, why do you think uh, statistics are important to track for NFTs? And like, what are the important statistics to track for NFTs? I think a lot of times people just want to know kind of what's going on in the overall marketplace. Like where, like you wake up in the morning and what went up last night? What went down? Uh, you, you see a floor price. How does that compare to like two weeks ago? one month ago. Like these are like super basic questions for making an investment. Um, so I really just provide people that. I think it's a lot of just giving them kind of the information that anyone would want when you make an investment. Like if you look at any stock and you go to Yahoo Finance, Google Finance, the first thing they're going to do is give you a price chart that shows you where it's been and where it is now. So a lot of what I do is present that to people, kind of this really basic information. And because it doesn't exist in that many places, like it, it becomes really revealing. For so here, here's one that's interesting. You posted this 35 minutes ago talking about the fall in top projects is the most dramatic. What's kind of your analysis of the top six projects versus the large caps and the mid caps? Well, I think, you know, one of the things I was focusing on, and this is pretty crazy for NFTs, is, you know, in most of April, uh, March, April, you saw the top five or six projects. So Moonbirds, Azukis, Clones, Doodles, and Apes basically uh, go up like 2x, while the rest of the entire market was down 20 to 30%. So I've never seen that before. And, you know, I used to work in in equities analysis. And you would never see some of the market go up 2x and then the rest go down 30%. Like normally things move a little bit in tandem. So this was a super crazy trend that was happening as money kind of just drifted towards the blue chips. So, you know, obviously we're in a pretty terrible market right now. And, and this chart was basically just saying this trend that we had seen has kind of started to reverse. Uh, these blue chips have really fallen really dramatically. And I think this is the type of thing that people know, like they see the board eight floor price go from 150 to 90. Like they know it, but you kind of get these charts that put these things you know to into a picture and that feels validating. So that was kind of what I was doing with this one. Yeah, this one's especially timely considering last night I went to bed with doodles at like a 20 ETH floor, woke up to it at 15 ETH. I mean, Azuki I think is at 17. I mean, everything basically, all the blue chips are basically well, uh, below the 20 ETH threshold, which is crazy. For sure. So I think a lot of projects are seeing the success that Bored Apes had last year with airdrops. Like, and they've done an amazing job. Bored Apes right now, if you make to the board ape uh, last year in April, that ape is now less than 50% of the value that you've gotten for all the things that Yuga has given you for having a board ape. So they've really done well with, with the airdrops. I think a lot of other sets are seeing that and wanting to imitate it. And, you know, I think a lot of other teams don't really know how to add value. So like doing an airdrop has been a really common strategy. Uh, what I showed with this is that the strategy this year has not been working. So these were four sets where they did airdrops and the combination of the airdrop plus the original token 
ended up being worth less than the original token was worth before the airdrop. So basically I'm seeing a lot of sets like doing this. And I just wanted to point out here that it's not really working that well. And then in other tweets, I wanted to say kind of, if you do want to do this, what actually makes it work? It almost seems like based off these charts that the idea of doing an airdrop is only good for the speculative nature of it, the run up to the airdrop. Because obviously we've seen here, we're looking at alien friends right now. We'll flip to world of women and world of women galaxy. I think the, the problem with this one too is also that uh, world of women galaxy looked exactly like world of women, which didn't help. But yeah, you can see here. And again, this is why it's, it is good. I think to look at charts is um, yeah, these airdrops have all dropped in value along with the OG price or the OG collection. Um, and really the airdrops, I mean, this is kind of showing you guys sell into the pump or sell into the prospect of this airdrop. Yeah. So check these out. This is clones and Azuki. And what, what, what they did was different. First of all, they dropped the like clone or Azuki dropped the beans and didn't charge any money. So everything was for the benefit of the OG holders. Like, I think that that's huge. Like that the team's not trying to make money for themselves and diluting kind of the original holders. So that was uh, one of the big differences. Also, you had the floor at like almost at 20. Um, and when the floor is at 20, you know, there are a lot of people who want Azuki's who can't afford it. So if you open up this new tier, you can create a whole bunch of new evangelists who actually like your project who don't have access otherwise. So I think there are certain circumstances. And the other thing that Azuki did and that clones did is they made the airdrop super different from the original. So Azuki did that kind of weird bean art that looked nothing like the original token. And then clones dropped pods, monolith boxes. Wow. And that stuff was just totally additive and very different from like World of Women, like you said, which is basically just another twist on the same art and basically just took World of Women from 10,000 to 32,000 total supply uh, without really expanding the narrative all that much. So uh, I think there are times where this can work, but you got to like, A, you have to have a pretty high NFT price so that you're bringing in a whole new level of, of users. And two, you have to expand your narrative and make it something different as opposed to uh, just another drop that feels like free money, but ultimately dilutes everybody and, uh, and hurts the project. I think NFT statistics just pontificated a great point about airdrops or additional collections. The ones that have succeeded, Azuki and Artifact, really dug into the speculative nature, not of the other projects you're talking about, like, okay, well, what's going to be the utility of a V Friends Series 2 or a Dead Friends? They almost, Azuki and Artifact, which went up after these launches, is, you know, they're mystery boxes, they're mystery beans, so they kind of doubled down on the mystery. So if you see a project, not financial advice, neither of us are financial advisors, crypto is extremely risky, especially now, but there's another project in the future who's doing an airdrop or something like that. Think about, is this going to be something we can continue to speculate on? Obviously, the monolith pods, what's inside the box? It's like Brad Pitt and said, what's inside the box? So people love to try to figure things out. And so that's kind of an inter interesting trend. Yeah, clones really get it. Like Artifact, they inside the box was another box, right? Like these guys are constantly making people wait for what's next. You know, and it's all about kind of dragging on the narrative, continuing the, the FOMO of your collectors, the anticipation, the mystery, uh, so that you never really want to sell. Now, obviously all this stuff is selling off now because we're in a bear market. But I think when the market was normal, you know, these guys were just climbing and climbing when you look at the, the price of the overall set. And I think they just maintain mystery incredibly well. There was always something else to look forward to. And the other thing with Azuki, um, you know, both these guys just dropped them in your wallet. You know, there was that amazing Azuki moment where the founder, at, you know, when Wiz Khalifa was playing, he did, they did that big event in LA and he said, oh, one more thing, check your wallets. Oh, and one more thing, check your wallets. It was just boom, here you go. Clones did the same thing, just boom, you got a pod in your wallet. And I think that that works a lot better than this anticipation because it's very hard to live up to the anticipation and then holders say, fuck that, or forget, like that was it, that's it. And they get disappointed uh, and, and the whole set struggles. So I, I think that these two guys really showed how it should be done if you wanna, if you really wanna add value. Uh, by the way, yeah, you can definitely curse. I curse way too much on my channel. That's why I don't have as many subscribers as I should. So this is nothing too crazy, but a lot of what I like to do is, you know, there, there become a lot of like myths or clear cliches on crypto Twitter, where everyone's like, it was so obvious, you know, that that board apes peaked at the other deed land drop because it was peak euphoria. And I say, look, yeah, I remember when they were dropping ape coin and it felt like peak euphoria and everyone was saying, now's the time to sell. Uh, so if you actually look at the chart here, we're still up a fair amount from when they dropped ape coin. Uh, and what I was trying to say with this is just like, look, you know, sometimes hindsight or hindsight can be perfect. You know, we know exactly what happened. We say things were obvious. But if you actually look at a longer tail picture, like we've gotten a lot wrong, we've gotten a lot right. Like these markets are extremely 
difficult to predict. Uh, let's just not pretend that they aren't and let's not pretend they were ever easy to predict or we'd all, you know, have so much money at this point, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be worried about it. So that was kind of what I was saying here. It was like that, that arrow is pointing to when Ape dropped which was another time crypto Twitter was saying like, this is the peak, this is peak euphoria. And then apes proceeded to basically double uh, in six weeks. Obviously now times are tougher, but uh, that was kind of the point of this one. And just like having the data is so empowering because people like to recraft these narratives of what happened. I say, look, I, I give away all my data for free. Just go look at, at, at my bio. If you look at the link in my bio, uh, you have basically all the floor history I have for every single set I've tracked. Yeah, and I just added volumes today. Look at the data before you say something, like get a feel for, for what's actually happened by the numbers uh, and it'll make your, your statements a lot more accurate. No, let's just create narratives. That's way more fun to do on Twitter. But yeah, let's say somebody does go to your Twitter bio and you know starts using some of your statistics or, or at least looks at them. I mean, I'm expecting a unique answer here. If I'm just starting out in NFTs, by the way, weird time for me to start out in NFTs when everything's so down or maybe the most opportune time in a while. What are the charts? What are the statistics I should be paying attention to? So my view is that floor price is everything. And this is kind of a controversial view, but I think like floor like dictates everything else. Like if you have a ton of volume and it doesn't lead to a floor price increase, it doesn't really matter that much. Like if you look at premium traits, they often track floor price like at a ratio. So a grail eight may be at like 10x the floor. And that normally tends to trend similar over time. So I think like digging into floor so much, pretty much all the analytical work I do is looking at how floor prices have moved over time. Um, because I just really think that floor sets the tone for the entire set. It sets the tone for sellers. Uh, it gives buyers a sense of you know if there's FOMO or not, and buyers don't want to buy, there's no FOMO. So that's why I've made floor price so available. That that said, I also do have 24 hour ETH volumes uh, day by day in a tab in that doc. So if you prefer to look at volumes, I have that as well. But uh, for me, everything I've done, like my my, my Twitter account has gone from 8,000 to 23,000 or 25,000 followers in three weeks. It's just been three weeks that the same, you know, I spent six months grinding to 8,000 and then it, it really climbed. And I think I've really just created a lot of charts that resonate with people that look at how floor prices have moved over time. And, and I think that's super informational and it's not something a lot of people what are your thoughts right now as somebody who's very tapped into these charts and statistics? Are we going to come out of this bear market? What are your thoughts on the current market? One of the one of the analysis I did was that looked at how uh, NFTs really are momentum assets. Like the single best indicator for how the floor price will move is how it moved yesterday. Uh, like so when things go down, there tends, you know, you really see a lot of momentum like where it just continues and continues. So I'm not like a huge believer in being a hero here and like buying to pick off the bottom. I think you've got to kind of wait to see some flattening, some momentum reversing, and then you'll have time. Uh, I think you want to wait till the floor price starts to increase before you start buying. Um, if you're going to buy though, I think there are a few teams that like have really proven themselves. You know, I think are, are in the process. I think Artifact, Azuki, Moonbirds, like these these are the these are the sets where the teams I think have shown a bit more state power. They have massive balance sheets, super creative people. Like I think those are the ones you want to start sneak or looking around for if you can. If you can't afford the top set, like look at the beans, look Look at the pods, look at the, the, you know, what these guys have done great is create entry points uh, across the price structure for, for their NFTs. So that's what I'd be looking to do if I weren't losing money right now. You, of course, um, talk about how you're a part of hindsight capital management. I'm a part of, uh, I'm fucked management. So um, I don't know whose name is more clever. Hindsight capital management, that's not me. I'm saying hind hindsight capital management is the only, the only fund that always gets it right. Well, yeah. So we're looking right here at a chart of World of Women, which is 83x um, that's a huge game, but what do you want to, what point do you want to make about this specific chart? Yeah. So world of women is up 83 X since mint. It minted at 0 0.06. I mean, it's been a rough ride for world of women. I own three. I know it. I feel it, but it's still up 83 X. Now what I'm showing here is that all those gains happen basically in five days. So what that green line is, is I assume that on the five best days for world of women, instead of being up three X or whatever, you were flat. If you take those five days out, that green line has been your return. So, you know, the, the day they announced Gaio Siri, it went from three to eight, right? So if you, so it's really just so NFTs, unlike most assets are all about like normally NFTs trend down, even stuff that's up a lot. Most days they go down, but it, it, the, the real money is made in like five or six huge FOMO pumps where they start going up and then everyone wants to get involved and then they reset higher. So I showed this for World of Women a little bit lower. I showed it for crypto punks. like punks are up 3x over the past year, but all of that money, all of that money has been made in five days. If you miss those five days, then uh, you're actually down on crypto punks. So it, it, this is just kind of the a trend I'm showing here. This one, 
phone blew my mind. Totally crazy. Doodles are up 190X from their mint price, 190X. Now, if I think of something up 190X in six months, I think it goes up all the time. But doodles have actually gone down more days than they've gone up. That's crazy. And, and the reason that's possible is because when they go up, they go up like double as much. So the up move, so what I'm basically saying here is like a lot of NFTs can be being patient. Like the natural state is to drift lower and just wait for that FOMO pump where it goes up massively. That's where the money is made. You got to be there for that. It can be really risky to chase it, but you got to be there for those pumps. That's where all the money is made in NFTs. And I think this is more true for NFTs than most other assets. A little bit with crypto, but definitely not quite this level with stocks or, or commodities or, or other assets. I think these statistics do a really great job of reinforcing what we already know, subconsciously know, but like probably don't tell ourselves enough. One is that like you're totally, I mean, this chart is totally right because, you know, I, I think if you really want to make money on the blue chips, you have to buy when there hasn't been an announcement with the idea that an announcement is coming. Like, you know, maybe a month ago, I got a doodles knowing space doodles had come out and it's kind of had seen its wave. And now I'm going to bank on the next big project because, you know, we had uh, somebody EB7, Eric was on this uh, YouTube account last week and he was talking about, he's saying money just really flows from Azuki, from clones to doodles. And it's all about just being one week ahead of the cycle of where, of when these projects are actually going to pump. We might've crushed it. Any Anything else you can think of? Any other stats you think would be? I'd say like, I'd say, look, man, I think what you said is what I'm trying to do, right? It's, there's a lot of stuff everybody knows and I just want to put pictures to it. Like this picture of Roger Federer. So I think the important note here, guys, is, you know, we should all have our own ideological evaluations of, you know, what we think the market, you know, uh, what markets do uh, with NFTs and stuff like that. But really everything you, you think you know is reinforced by statistics. Many of the statistics brought to you by NFT statistics. Dottie, he's, he's got the ENS name, guys. That's official. That's Punk9059 on Twitter. Thanks so much, man. And um, yeah, uh, 25,000 now. I'm thinking 50,000 next month. Cool, man. And I, one thing I'd say is like, if anyone has thoughts or things they want to look into, just DM me. I respond to almost all my DMs. Um, like my account, I FUD my own bags all the time. I'm just constantly, like my goal with this is just to be honest, give you insight. I'm never pumping my bag. I'm always just trying to be honest. So that's, uh, that's my goal here and hit me up if you have questions. Oh, uh, I'm not worrying about the bear market or anything like that. I'm just worried, are you guys commenting? Are you liking? Do you even want Jukiverse whitelist spots? I think you do, so make sure to do both those things. Also, push that subscribe button. Thank you guys so much for watching. I think these videos are fun. I think the interview format is fun. Let me know in the comments if you guys want more videos like this. And as always, remember to say, get, get!